Ça va le faire, ça va le faire. Donc, normalement, tu peux lui dire que ça devrait commencer. C'est bon, je l'ai mis. Aline, si tu peux le partager aussi sur le site. Je viens d'envoyer par mail. Et puis, ben, peut-être, on... so should we start? Uh, we are just 22. Okay. Yesterday, we were a bit more, but uh, I don't know. We can wait a bit or maybe we can just start if it's okay. It's five minutes after. Yeah, it's five minutes the after time. time. So maybe it's, we can start. Mm -hmm. You agree? Yeah. You, you are the chief, or yeah. I am the chief. <laughs> yeah, I think we can start. People will 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 keep coming. Uh, that's that's fine. <laughs> so okay, just uh, look. There are words. three there, so it's uh, 25 people already. We, nous sommes trois. C'est ça que je voulais dire. Ah, very good. Uh, uh, may I say compliments to the organization committee, Oriel, Patrick, and the Inus. Aline, Thank you. You are doing great. Okay, now uh, I go transparent. Okay. Um, Olivier, c'est bon. François, il est content. Ça marche. Très bien. Que ça marche sur YouTube. Okay, parfait. Uh, let's uh, let's start then. Uh, okay. All the recordings are on. Uh, Patrick, you you can start. Yeah, just a, a few words to introduce this day. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you for this second day of uh, our joint uh, workshop with uh, Eve and Lava Project. Um, yesterday we had a great audience with, uh, if I remember well, 47 participants at the, at the best time and uh, more than 200 people on the, on the fast the book. Uh, YouTube. 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 Ah, YouTube, not fast the book. Uh, And um, this morning, this session will be led by Andy, Andy Harris. And uh, Andy, I, I give you the floor right away. We can start the session. Thank you, Patrick. Although first, I think Oriel wanted to make a couple of organizational and timetable announcements. Okay. Yes, ju ju just very quickly um, to say that um, this afternoon, it will not be Uh, on YouTube, nor recorded because this afternoon it's just for the exercise. So it is just for the people who register, who will do the expert elicitation. So today we just have this morning session and tomorrow we will start at 9.30 instead of 9, no, at 9 instead of 9.30. So I will send again an email and, and that's it. That's it, Andy. Then you can... Stop. May I just say one more thing for the yes. exercise? So if there are any other people who didn't make it to send us the demographic sheet or let, let us know that they would like to participate, please uh, let us know no later than uh, 12 so that we can have uh, an idea about the, the, the total participants. And uh, Yeah, so anyone who would like to participate, please send uh, an email uh, or, and the demographic sheet to e.elicitation at uh, gmail.com. That's it. Thanks. And I've had a few questions as well, whether you can do the exercise uh, in the Zoom by following the Zoom site or the YouTube site. And the answer is both. You can do the, ex um, the exercise if you're following YouTube. Likewise, Zoom. That's correct, isn't it, Alessandro? Yeah, but please let, let us know as, uh, um, as quickly as possible. No, because the idea was not to put to put it on YouTube. So can, can we can we follow it on YouTube, please, as a result? Also, it would be good to record that because Patrick will be starting off with the unrest uh, ah, presentation, so which is good for Eve. So, so we uh, uh, we record and we put on YouTube. Yes, please. Or if not, people can also um, connect to the Zoom instead of being on YouTube. Let's talk about it at lunchtime. Okay. Yeah. 
So Olivier, if um, you want to share your screen, the, the floor is yours. Uh, many thanks to you, uh, Andrew. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the conveners from both of these week's workshops for inviting me to give a paper today on the topic of flow and volcanism in France. Uh, the context of for my paper today is quite specific. Uh, it comes just after last, last week's symposium on law and volcanism that I organized along with the Legal Research Center from clermont Auvergne University. And this symposium provides a strong basis for further invest investigation into the legal aspects of volcanic risk management. I will now present some of the results from my own research on the subject, uh, which will later be published as a book. Uh, I described these results in more detail when opening last week's uh, symposium. I hope my, that uh, my brief presentation of the said results will be useful for many of you uh, today. Uh, the general line of argument I want to emphasize is that there must be a partnership, a partnership between the law of a given society and volcanic risk management within such a society. If the relationships between the two is out of sync, there is a commensurate specific risk for, for both society and volcanic, volcanic, risk, volcanic risk management. Uh, on the one hand, uh, if the law of a society em embodies the fundamental values of others and liberty, equality and fraternity, uh, this could determine an ineffective volcanic risk management system. Uh, this is what happened when the island of Martinique and Réunion among other territories were under the colonial domination of the French state. Uh, the governor of each of these colonies was in charge of upholding colonial rule. As such, the governor could make use of specific police powers, uh, the goals of which were to uphold the security and the peace of the colonial system, rather than public security or public peace. My research shows that this peculiar perspective had led the governor to design and run a volcanic risk management system that was both unequal and ineffective. Uh, the main determining factor on, of the system is what was a, it, what was a stake. Uh, what did the security and peace of the colony imply in response to volcanic hazards? Uh, for, for colonial governors, upholding uh, colonial rule meant that people were to stay near where they resided. The movement of people was feared because it could lead to problems with security, peace, and health at their point of destination. I refer to this implication as a home issue. Evacuation orders, spontaneous evacuation, or exclusion zones were thus seen as directly inconsistent with the requirements of colonial public order. For colonial governors, upholding colonial rule also entailed that every landowner and industrial operator has a fundamental right to expect all income from them, their activities. Uh, this means that in the case of an evacuation, those who mainly worked under very unfair conditions and had to return to their plantation or factory as soon as possible. As this issue reflects the core of colonial rule, I call it the symbolic unequal issue. When word issue came up, it was always within the framework of, of, the, of the home issue or symbolic unequal issue. Uh, from the main determining factor, an ancillary one is derived, what volcanic phenomena could possibly threaten colonial public order? Uh, with regard to this question, Reunion Island is a model case. People have spontaneously settled away from the Grand Brule, where most of the volcanic phenomena occur. So colonial governors thought that volcanic hazards were volcanic phenomena that might reveal 
an ongoing displacement of the volcanic center of activity on the island. In 1939, for example, uh, falling ash and falling Perez air on Salazi were considered to be such a risk. Another ancillary factor of the system was the volcanic risk assessment method. Uh, colonial public order was the only issue at stake in this system. So governors thought that only assessments by, the, by their own administration were appropriate. Uh, this is obvious in the case of Reunion Island, where administrative monitoring of the eruptions was carried out from 1871 to 1939. But such monitoring was highly dysfunctional as its organization was far too authoritarian. Due to the internal nature of this perspective, a systematic mistrust was expressed uh, towards any method, any method that entails the mobilization of external assessment criteria, such as in scientific-based approaches. For a long time in Martinique, science was thus in instrumentalized by colonial governors in order to support their views about what colonial public order entailed. It was only in 1932 that a genuine volcanological observatory was founded in Martinique. In Reunion Island, no such steps were taken in that direction, despite pushes from Lacroix and some occasional initiatives from his local scientific correspondents. Uh, this is what the volcanic risk management system was under colonial rule. And my research shows that this kind of volcanic risk management system was very much contributed to the volcanic disasters that happened in Martinique in 1902. Uh, on, the other hand, on the other hand now, uh, the law of a democratic society can be profoundly challenged uh, by volcanic risk management when this management is not ruled but uh, by a sufficiently accurate, uh, accu accurate legal, legal framework. Uh, this is a conclusion we can draw from the experience of the islands of Reunion, Guadeloupe and Martinique uh, since they, they became an integral part of the French Republic in 1946. Uh, let us not, not forget the basic norm of every constitutional legal system as it has, as it has been expressed under Article 17 uh, of the French Declaration, Declar Declaration of Human and Civic Rights of uh, 1789, and which is still applicable as a French constitutional rule today. Any society in which no provision is made for guaranteeing rights or for the separation, separation of powers as no constitution. Uh, the um, the uh, 1976 eruption of Guadeloupe Souffrier volcano led to a serious, to a serious breach of, this, of the basic principle of the separation of powers. Uh, my research on the shows, it is foreseeable that the next major volcanic crisis will lead to a major breach of the even more basic principle of guaranteeing rights, if nothing is done to tailor the French law to prevent volcanic risk. Uh, in August, in August uh, uh, 1976, uh, the state deputy of Guadeloupe Island was warned by the scientists, was warned by the, by the society, scientists in charge that a disastrous pyroclastic flow was expected from the Soufrier. He immediately issued an evacuation, order, an evacuation order and created a large exclusion zone that nobody was allowed to enter, uh, to enter without explicit authorization. An exclusion, an exclusion zone in which everybody was expected to obey military and civil authorities under orders. This was akin to what is described as martial law uh, elsewhere. Uh, this situation went on for many months. Uh, a lawyer called uh, Felix Ward sued the state for exceeding its power before the administrative jurisdiction, but the case was eventually dismissed by the French administrative Supreme Court uh, in 1983. Uh, 
Nevertheless, nevertheless, the administrative Supreme Court's reasoning uh, shows that the French law has been manhandled to an extreme extent in order to compensate for its inaccuracy in preventing volcanic risks. Uh, usually, usually uh, uh, all administrative authorities will comply with the applicable law. However, it is traditionally acknowledged that in order to fulfill its mission uh, in an emergency, uh, such an authority can make a decision on a particular case without completely complying with the law, especially regarding the rules as to procedures and form. It is traditionally, traditionally equally acknowledged that, that a parliamentary act is required in order to broaden this, such a possibility to many cases uh, over a given period of time. French law includes such stat statutory law. For example, the 1849 State of Siege Act and the 1955 State of Emergency Act. Uh, nevertheless, in some World War I cases, uh, the French Supreme Administrative Court uh, decided that exceptional circumstances, that is a, a legal concept, exceptional circumstances, for so the, the French Supreme Administrative Court decided that exceptional circumstances suffice to warrant extra, extraordinary powers in order to allow an administrative authority to carry out its mission for an extended period of time. This is, uh, even though these extraordinary powers cannot be granted in a parliamentary act. Ultimately, this has become established case law according to which a Supreme Court, a Supreme Court gives, it, gives itself the right to do something that would, normal, that would normally only be within the remit of parliament. And this without any clear constitutional basis. Undoubtedly, this is a breach in the basic principle of the separation of powers. Uh, in the what case, uh, the French Supreme Administrative Court noted that the creation of, the, uh, of an exclusion zone and the evacuation order could, could only be grounded by the uh, 1955 State of Emergency Act. Uh, in order to be put into practice, this act, this act require, requires a formal decision by the French government and no such decision was adopted in the case of Guadeloupe Soufrière. To avoid the nullification of the state deputy measures, the court decided exceptional circumstances warranted the ordinary powers of the state deputy to be considered as allowing the grounding of measures usually, usually permissible only during a state of emergency period. Uh, the volcanic crisis thus led to a breach uh, in the basic principle of the separation of powers. Above all, uh, this breach had a very limited rational basis. On the, word, on the one hand, the state deputy and the Supreme Court took, it, took into account the assessments made by the scientists in charge until the end of August 1976. On the other hand, they were unable, un, unable to, make, to take into account the further assessments uh, because of the volcanological dispute, dispute, dispute at this time. Uh, the French Supreme Administrative Court had thus emphasized that volcanological expertise should be exercised by scientists who are recognized by the, first, by, by the French state and who serve to provide consistent information about ongoing volcanic activity to the administrative authority. Volcanological expertise thus presents constitutional issues. Uh, since uh, 1983, nothing has been done to provide a precise legal basis for the, the administrative emergency powers that are fit uh, for the purpose of preventing the most intense and immediate volcanic risks, the power to order mass evacuation, as well as the powers needed to create and then manage an exclusion zones and an exclusion zone and everything that entails. Uh, this is clearly inconsistent with the basic principle of guaranteeing rights 
which has acquired a prominent status among the basic, basic legal principles since 1983, uh, partly due to the increased effectiveness of the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, each, member, each, each member state shall guarantee the people under its jurisdiction the right to life. And according to the European Court of Human Rights, that means uh, domestic authorities shall carry out a set of positive obligations with both a procedural and material scope. Uh, the positive obligation resulting from the right to life uh, shall be a reasonable interpretation of this right, uh, that is to say, an interpretation that takes into account all the other relevant fundamental rights and freedoms. When a domestic authority issues a measure in order to protect uh, the right to life, uh, it shall carry out this positive obligation. It thus uh, restricts the scope of other fundamental rights and freedoms, and these restrictions shall respect the requirement of proportionality. Uh, this requirement is made up of a triple test, a triple test, a triple test sorry. First, firstly, is, this, is a type of restriction appropriate considering the practical objectives, uh, objectives pursued by the domestic authorities? Uh, if the restrictions, secondly, are deemed to be appropriate, uh, the scope should not exceed what is necessary to reach these practical objectives. And thirdly, if the restrictions are deemed to be appropriate and necessary, uh, the, practic the practical objectives should have been defined considering all, relevant, all the other relevant objectives. Uh, this European case law has been embedded in national law. In particular, the uh, requirement of proportionality has led the French Constitutional Court to declare unconstitutional some provisions of the State of Emergency Act. These provisions defined extraordinary administrative powers, and they were nullified because of their lack, because of their lack of accuracy regarding the limits of these powers. But the same requirement is a fortiori a near death sentence for exceptional circumstances case law. Uh, in this respect, the sanitary crisis in France is a model case. Uh, the first measure has to, have to be grounded in, the, in this case law, in the exceptional circumstances case law. But the uh, requirement of proportionality led the French parliament to immediately create a new exceptional legal regime the state of sanitary emergency. A major volcanic crisis could also trigger such a legal scenario. Uh, to conclude, uh, I have chosen the most extreme examples to, to, stress, to stress that there must be a partnership between the law of a given society and the volcanic risk management within such a society. However, this is an everyday necessity. Uh, volcanic risk management is often grounded in operational protocols uh, that define, for example, partnerships between volcanological experts and civil protection services. Uh, it is of fundamental importance to design and run these protocols uh, to, uh, so as to comply with the applicable law. This has not always been done up until now, uh, which just raises, raises two major legal risks, two major Sorry, this has not always been done up to now, which thus raises, raises two major legal risks on a regular basis. Uh, the risk of illegally infringing on some fundamental rights, the risk of exposing some people to serious threat of death or injury. In such, in such, case, in such, in such cases, judicial review, liability claims, and criminal prosecutions are uh, always very likely to follow suit. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier. Um, that was fascinating, if not a little worrying and, or disconcerting. Um, does, does anyone have, at least for, from our um, legal point of view when responding to a crisis, 
in that aspect, do, does anyone have any questions for Olivier? Maybe I can. Uh, attend, uh, maybe I can ask. So, what will be, what should be done then to fill the gaps that there is right now in the in the law? Do we need a new text, or do we to define better the role of each person? Or? But, um... Many things can be done. Uh, first, of course, uh, a, a new parliamentary act is needed in order to, to give ground to uh, em em extraordinary administrative powers. Uh, but uh, uh, for, uh, and secondly, uh, the uh, it is, uh, I, I think it is very important to uh, clearly, uh, I mean, how to say it, uh, uh, to remind that uh, of, uh, it, it's especially for civil protection services, uh, which, uh, which, which uh, uh, for, for who, final, for who, uh, some emergency plans uh, can uh, replace uh, the applicable law. And uh, I think that uh, civil, uh, civil protection services must uh, always uh, remind that uh, an, emer an emergency plan is uh, only uh, a set of guidelines in order to, uh, to, to comply with the applicable law. And uh, in some cases, in some cases, I think that civil protection services maybe uh, forget this and uh, apply the emergency plan uh, without taking into account that uh, there is a legal order behind it. And uh, it's uh, so it's a, it's a practical solution and uh, something that must be. Uh, that must uh, be practiced. And uh, it's not uh, something very easy to, to, to do. Thank you. So are there any other questions from the floor? Can I ask a question, Olivier? Yep. Um, were there, there, there was the, the, the legal conference at the, the end of last week. Um, were, were, there, were there any um, fundamental conclusions or directions defined as a result of that meeting to try and um, move, the, move the situation forward? Uh, sorry, I, I, I didn't hear the, the end of the, your question. Were there any major conclusions or recommendations from last week's meeting? Um, to, to help to ameliorate the, the situation? Uh, no, there, there was a final report, but uh, the, some practical recommendation will follow but later. Great. Thank you. Um, the next presentation in, in this morning's sequence is from uh, Nicolas Villeneuve from the University of La Ray Union. Um, president, direct, uh, president, previous director of the observatory uh, at Piton de la Fournesse. And he's going to be reviewing some work, uh, well, a great body of work he's been doing over the last decade about uh, the sentimental attachment of the local population, the reunion population to their volcano, and uh, also the problem of visitor uh, frequentation and accidents amongst that visitor population and their preparedness. So Nicola, over to you. Microphone. Okay, sorry for the microphone. Uh, thanks so much Andy to introduce me and uh, um, good morning or good night, I don't know 
for ladies and gentlemen, so I will say hi to everybody. Yes, I'm going to speak about a subject uh, that is not my center of research, uh, but um, it is, moreover, a very a real subject uh, with uh, its full, its protocol, um, reference, and uh, I deal it uh, during several years before in order to obtain a very typical French diploma called HDR. During those years, uh, I discovered that uh, there was a very fertile ground to do great science. Julie Morin had um, somewhat deal also with this aspect, but we choose two positions different to, to manage and or to make our research. So uh, I'm very happy to, to see that she is following me uh, just after. So I will to, to present you uh, the societal issue of uh, volcanic risk at Piton. And uh, I would like to share this presentation with people who help me a lot to collect data and also to analyze those, those data. And we have some very, very fertile uh, discussion about this. I'm going to suggest to um, treat this uh, following the outline with um, the presentation first at the first presentation of uh, art database in order to qualify and to quantify the love story between the local citizen and the Piton. And after that, we are going on uh, the consequence of that and also the consequence of in terms of accident. So first, um, the question I asked in my mind was, uh, what is the position of the Piton La Fournaise in terms of uh, daily life for people in Wayne Island? First, um, here I want to show you um, the study I made about the public perception of the Piton de la Fournaise through four databases we build. So, the database is a local song database with uh, presence of words Piton de la Fournaise. We found a lot of them, uh, around 100 uh, titles. We also done a uh, um, database about film, movie. TV films, uh, series, and advertising. We also done a um, database about poster tags and comic strip, and also from uh, flags. Here, it's um, I show you how I analyzed the data set, gather the song database with nine theme uh, that uh, characterize very well um, each of them. The same are for example, rejection of uh, dependence, aesthetic and specialization, but also myth and lesion, and also a positive view, rhythm, and so on. For instance, I can give you some title, just four, because it's, uh, the database is too long. But if you take the very famous uh, Mon Pays, which can be translated in my country by uh, uh, David Sicard, here the singer is very proud to have in his uh, ancestor ancestor, sorry, slaves who fled uh, their slave statement to live in the piton wide area. The following one is Pays uh, uh, Fou, which can be translated in um, my country, Mad Boat. Um, he had been writing when uh, the leader of the group was completely opposed to the development of uh, the island with the rule of the French government. When uh, the singer sing uh, that the lava painting the sea in red, in fact, it's a metaphoric form where it represents uh, the blood of the yesterday and today's slave who died for the French government. Um, Daniel Waro is a very iconic guy in Wayne Island. And uh, with Sun Wu, which is with, with you, um, he, he shows the symbolic of flow with a metaphor between his relationship with his wife and the relation between the ocean and the volcano. This relation is a dramatic one, and uh, this is a, a classic and a very iconic uh, song of love in Wainia. Uh, the following one is, I think, uh, a very interesting one is Pajon is very local, very uh, uh, marked um, group in Wainia Island, and Volcan is uh, uh, a song where they remember about the different myths and legends 
about the volcano. And uh, at least I want to speak about the best one, the most important one, I think, is La Réunion Les Pianou, or um, Réunion is not longer ours, from Usanu Sava, uh, which uh, touched two different theme, uh, theme in the same time. The first one is the uh, risk, because the singer it describes the potential danger on the volcano, but he also speaks about the rejection of authority. In 2004, when he wrote this uh, song, he invited uh, people to go as far as possible close to the volcano during the eruption, just because he said in 2004, it will be no longer able to do it. So it was very anticipatory. Turn on another database uh, made around the film, movie, TV set, and uh, series made on the volcano. We found 17 of them, and uh, it's very, very interesting to see that uh, uh, sometimes there are dramas, sometimes there are comedies, sometimes science fiction, but uh, with two opposite philosophy, um, either the volcano identifies very well, very precisely the Rainon Island, but with different time historical period. Either the volcano um, landscape represents an anywhere or maybe an, a nowhere um, like, for instance, in, uh, in America, uh, where the characters are supposed to be in South America, or also in the uh, Jack planet, or planet of, of idiots, which is, uh, you understood, you understand uh, the characters are in the planet of Jack, of course, um, or also in uh, Aedena, for instance, where uh, the character is uh, located in the Garden of Eden. Plenty of films are made here in Réunion, and it's very, very easy to understand when you know that um, Réunion Island Council greatly helps um, production by important funding to come here and make their movie there. We found also a lot of examples of uh, use of using the volcano um, for advertising medium. For instance, it's very interesting to see that sometimes the advertising pass different message. A principal, which is a brand communication, of course, but another, which is more political, but not very direct. This is a case here for this communication done by uh, the central tourist body, which film mountain bakers here, and also paragliders who are practicing their activity in the middle of the national park. And you have to know that uh, those activities are completely prohibited there. In, in definitive, in addition with the invitation to the tourists to come to see our beautiful landscape, the Ile de la Réunion tourism shows its disagreement with the policies of the national park here. Of course, when we look where the film has been done, we see that La Plaine des Sables is the most important place due to the aesthetic of the place, due to the logistic facility, but also uh, due to the timeless connotation and the spatial less connotation or not. Of course, there are plenty other databases we've done as uh, posters where uh, you can see the volcan is uh, very beautiful but also tags with um, one of the best famous uh, uh, character used here in Réunion is uh, Buzu, a um, faceless little personage who is very, very, uh, we, we, we feel his feeling on the place uh, close to the beautiful and very friendly volcano. Um, apart here, you can see the volcano is uh, a little bit dangerous and it's funny to say that this um, painting is, this tag is very close to the 1977 eruption outside of Saint Clos. Of course, we also found a database on comic strip with uh, different approach with historical, romantical, science fiction genre. But in a um, lot of cases, there is a real attention give to the quality 
of the morphological details. As here for fever from uh, uh, done very, very very recently. In definitive, if we analyze all data set, we can see that the Volker uh, illustration give the different aspect as uh, first aesthetic, identification of territory, policies issue, identity of people, myth and legend, memory of slave, undefined uh, location, and sometimes. Of course, some errors are present on, uh, on this representation. You can see here three of or four non-official flags. And on three of them, we've got a suggestion of the volcano here in red in three cases. The second part of my presentation is um, about uh, the reason of uh, this love, this love story between Reunion Islander and, uh, and the volcano. We can see, according to the geographer Christian Germanaz, between the arrival of the first citizen in the middle of the 17th century and uh, 1965, 1,000 people reach the edge of the volcano. It is, uh, uh, we, we show very important, we find a very important change linked to the initiative began in 1957. Uh, and ended in 1968, uh, which was the building of the road toward the volcano. At the construction of this road, um, the local authority anticipate the, a, a big change after uh, the construction, and uh, they decide to put in place uh, visitor management, especially during the eruption. Very closer than us, we can see that on this map that three uh, counters, two car counter and uh, one uh, trailer counter, have been installed, have been set up by um, National Forest Office. And uh, between 2011 and between and, uh, 2020, about uh, 354. Thousand people per year reach the Pad Belcombe here in front of the volcano at the car parking. If we look on the detail uh, at the daily scale, we can see that uh, people are coming every day, maybe a little bit more on Saturday, on Sunday, sorry. Uh, they are coming mostly on October and November and mostly in 2015 and 2018. The reason why they have been more numerous in 2015 and 2018 is just due to the activity of the volcano, which was very intense during those two years. Why are they coming uh, during October and November? This is a very well known year that it's a more touristic period, and uh, they are coming on the volcano every day. So we can conclude that people who are coming to volcano in the uh, normal period without eruption are vacationer because they are coming when they want, even if they are from Wayne, of course. If we look uh, for the path inside uh, the, the hiking path inside the enclos, we can see that uh, for the same period, 120,000 persons came on the volcano per year. And here in the data, we can see the same trend with people every day a week, with people much more in October and November, but at the inverse, the 2015 and 2018 uh, year was the uh, smaller one. You have to know uh, or remember that uh, we've got a, a gate on the volcano. This is maybe the lonely volcano with a gate. And during the period uh, discussed by um, Stefan Dren yesterday, the period of the activity of the volcano, this gate is closed and the entrance on the Enclos Cree is completely forbidden. If we look during an eruption, during eruption and during six years, we can see between 2015 and 2020, here red bars, which correspond to uh, eruption period, orange bar, which correspond to uh, post and pre uh, eruption period when the gate is closed, we can see that the frequentation of the road 
is increased on this green uh, line, is increased a load. Uh, at inverts, the frequentation of the path is descending a load and tangent to zero. Even if we know that uh, some dozen of person pass by the wall and go through the volcano, even if it's forbidden. And we know that because of we saw them on the field, but also because of uh, they, communicate, they communicate a lot on, uh, the, on uh, the social network. The first consequence of that is of this attractiveness of the volcano is a very important traffic jam on the lonely gravel road able to carry people on the volcano edge. The second one is more and more people are coming inside the volcano since very long time, of course, but there are some lovers of eruption and they go away, even if it's forbidden, even if it's closed, they go to see the volcano eruption very, very uh, far and very, very close to the volcano. Yet, even if uh, on this picture, all white dot are visitor, who do not have right to come on, on the volcano. We can clearly see here on this uh, tangent to zero uh, slope that uh, even if there are a lot of people in the volcano during the eruption, the rule set up by the prefecture and the gate are very respect. The people who are coming are not, in terms of numerous, are not comparable to the activity we can find on the volcano when uh, it completely open. We also note that uh, um, academic communication or simply uh, through the social network communication, um, thanks to that, people know very well and very fast uh, where is the best observation area and uh, what is the difficulties they will encounter if they decide to work inside the enclosed area. Thus, uh, if we look at the statistics we, we've done, we can see that uh, if uh, we have an eruption very easily visible from the Pat Belcombe or from the Piton Partage, uh, it leads it lead, um, to increase the road traffic to um, more than 900% compared with an identical period without an eruption. For those eruption that are at less than one hour, one hour and a half from the Pat Belcombe by walking path, um, we can see that the main gate filter 60 to 94% of visitor flow. When the eruption is located at the south flank of the volcano, as is the case currently, we can see that uh, people have to walk during three hours to go on outside of, outside place to visit the volcano and to see the eruption, or they are to walk, they have to walk between six and ten hours to reach the eruption place. This kind of eruption allow to increase the frequentation of the road till four hundred percent in addition compared with uh, the usual eruption, the usual uh, period. Uh, in terms of uh, filtration of, uh, uh, of the Pat Belcombe, uh, thanks to the main gate, you can see that 80 to 87 percent of people are uh, filtered at the entrance. Finally, we know that more the activity is far away from the Pat Belcombe and more the visitor flux decrease due to the difficulty of the direct observation or the approach on the eruptive site. In this case, it is uh, often the national road in uh, the Grand Brûlé, which is the place where the observation have done. And um, it, is, it is the same thing since a very, very long period. And as it's shown by this document um, found by, by Olivier, and this document shows that uh, correspondence between uh, uh, a senior official uh, of La Prefecture de la Réunion and uh, the uh, police uh, official, maybe, official, maybe, uh, 
uh, in uh, the during the eruption of 1961. Let me turn on my third part of this presentation, uh, the consequence in terms of accident. A study we began with uh, two colleagues and friends about uh, the accidentology at Piton la Fournaise by looking in the testimony of the literature and newspaper. We found 26 deaths on the volcano signs. Um, in 1799, but uh, there is a problem of, uh, of quality of data sets. So we consider it is correct since uh, 1970, uh, where 22 persons died since this period, of course. Uh, this is representing uh, approximately uh, one death uh, every two years and three months, which is very far from the four deaths a year in Hawaii uh, that we can find in EGI and AL uh, database. And it's very far from the dangerosity of cyclone here, especially in Rainier. In details, we can see that um, most uh, fatalities uh, occurred when there is no eruption, but don't uh, forget that uh, for a day of uh, eruption we've got for this period, 6.7 day of non-eruption day. Uh, okay. Uh, what happened? Um, mostly people are died in the enclos. They are between 30 and 39 years old. They are men and they usually died uh, from fall down or cold or um, uh, discomfort. The um, PGHM is a specific uh, police group who work on um, mountain rescue. Uh, they, ask, they ask share their database, and we can see that uh, uh, specifically on the volcano sector, 11% uh, of the total of rescue have been done only on the volcano. It uh, gives 20% of uh, victims. Uh, 875 persons have been um, rescued for the period between 2001 and 2015. And we can see on this, um, on this graph that 61% um, of those persons are, are unhurt. It is probably people who have been uh, uh, rescued during the beginning of uh, seismic crisis or the beginning of an eruption. So they have just been evacuated from the, from the volcano. 27% of people are injured and only 1% of people death on the volcano. Considering the death people, we can see that uh, compared with the wall activity on the mountain, uh, death uh, or fatality on the volcano just uh, correspond to 11% of wall, the fatality taken in charge by the PGHM. We tried to compare uh, our data set with the data set built by uh, Egi et al. in 2010, but it's very difficult to compare Hawaii in um, Hawaii Volcano National Park and Wainan Island uh, Volcano because the, um, we don't have the same context. In uh, Hawaii, there are so many visitors. There are plenty helicopters, plenty um, uh, facility due to accident, and also because of uh, the policies of the national park is very very strict compared uh, to what happened here in Rainier. Now I just uh, have to thank you for your listening, but just before I would like to use these three uh, illustrations. To conclude and make a summary of my talk, uh, those illustrations uh, have been uh, acquired during this weekend. And you can see traffic jam with a traffic ticket um, put it here by a policeman. You can see also uh, some accidents on the road occurred when people uh, very uh, tired um, came back from the volcano. Two of us uh, have been. Uh, count during the weekend, and also a young guy fell down in a big crack 
uh, outside of the enclos is uh, is okay now, but it was a little afraid for us. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, do we have any any questions from the audience? I have one yeah. while there is no one else. Nicola, the death related to the volcano, you say it's uh, how directly is it related to the volcano? You say it's one person every two years or something. Is it directly because of gas, lava, or it's because uh, dehydration or, or other things? And in Hawaii as well, what's the, the depth okay. in Hawaii related to directly? Um, in, in most cases, uh, it's not directly due to the eruption. Uh, in Winnian Island, we've got only one example of a guy who fell down in a uh, odd fracture. We've got also a guy who we, we, he missed. We never find him after. Uh, in our eyes, they've got um, more example of that, but um, it's a kind of a collateral um, injury and collateral uh, death because of most of them, as you can see in terms of uh, um, proportional uh, proportion between time, most of them died during uh, an eruptive crisis, in fact. It's not, it, if uh, you, if I can share again my, my screen, I can show you because I, I pass it very fast. Okay, here it is. No, it's this one. Okay, you can see that uh, only eight fatality occurred during an eruption and 14 outside of eruption period. But as I tell you there, the facility, the day of eruption is one, to 6.7 day without eruption for this period. That means that eight is, is a lot, in fact. And uh, one very recent death, uh, the last one, occurred at uh, four o'clock in the morning during a very bad weather. And uh, the guy came back from the eruption outside of the enclos and uh, he fell down. Uh, there was a cliff for about uh, 100 meter high and uh, he died there. And it's, for me, it's collateral uh, aspect of those eruptions. But it, first, this is a, a high mountain accident. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also you said um, the PGHM rescue people on the volcano. You had these slides showing uh, mm -hmm. how many people he rescued outside the volcano on the volcano. And the question is, how many did they rescue during an eruption? And if uh, this happened sometime or not? Okay, this is, this is, uh, there are a lot of things to do now. <laughs> and this no, is I'm just asking by you. No, no, it's, um, the statistic is very fragile currently. We need more information. Uh, PGHM is a very small group and they work a lot. We discuss when we can, but uh, I don't have more information now. I, I would like to know from PGHM the genre, for example, the, of course, the, the date. But from, uh, what, from what you know, do you have in mind sometimes that it happened during an eruption that the Beshashem is coming in the Anklo to get someone out? Do you remember any of this? Yeah, uh, they are coming for police, uh, um, yes, tickets. police action, of course. Yes, uh, I saw them it's... doing this, but for rescue. Yeah, yeah. for rescue, they, 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 I, I don't, so I don't uh, know, I'm not aware with any kind of uh, action done um, by the, the PGHM in order to rescue someone during an eruption, a guy uh, who were not able to be there. Apart, Alexandre in 2003, but he unfortunately uh, died, but he, it was during a, a, an opening period. Okay, because this is a question as well we can ask ourselves. If someone is in difficulty during an eruption, somewhere where he's not supposed to be, will he or, he or her call the, the BGHM or not? Huh, yeah. So do in they declare they broke their leg or not okay. in the in the enclos because they are there? And they but everybody knows that, but Olivier is 
better than I in this part, but everybody knows that in France, it's, um, it's a law, it's a rule. Uh, when someone has an angel somewhere, even if it's not a place you have to be, uh, you have to be rescued. Mm -hmm. This is the first. Maybe you're going to have a ticket, but you're going to be rescued. Rescued. And, He's uh, going to be the, rescued, but will he call to be rescued? Yeah, because they are scared. Problem, so maybe they will uh, not call and we are not aware of that. Yes. Yeah, but mm. with a leg break, I think uh, mm. you, you can call. You, call. you will call. Uh, of course, it's not very easy some, in some place to, to use uh, your phone call. Nicola, I've got a quick question. Um, yes. You showed that during every eruption, um, the road, there's one road in to the volcano, to the eruptive side, and that quickly gets blocked up. Um, does that impede the ability of the observatory to get into the eruptive site to carry out monitoring duties? And also, does it impede the access to the emergency services who need to access the site? So um, first, uh, maybe, maybe Aline will... Uh... We'll have some answer about that. But um, last weekend, uh, uh, we, we, we have been on the volcano to make some, some measurement with the observatory. And I, I took the helicopter here in, uh, in Saint Gilles. So it's 70 kilometers far from the, ups, the, the volcano. And uh, Aline and the group were uh, blocked in the middle of the traffic jam. Uh, even if they are from the observatory, and if uh, uh, ambulance or rescue vehicle was there, uh, it was blocked as everyone because people leave their car anywhere, and there is only one gravel road, only one. And uh, at the beginning, as uh, as Aline presented yesterday, at the beginning of eruption, they can easily ask the PGHM to come with the helicopter of the, the police uh, section, specific area of police section. But it's not every day, for sure. And it's not for all the group. So uh, the, the group and the urgent uh, activity are the same than people on the world. Anyway, I saw that uh, on my statistical approach that the people are less and less numerous during a crisis, if the crisis is long. The first week is completely busy, but after, after that, it, it go down. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, our next presentation this morning um, is from Julie Moran and she'll be going back to the 2007 eruption of Piton de la Fornes which is the historically the, the biggest eruption that has been on the island um, and she's going to look now at evacuation challenges uh, that were faced specifically during that eruption. Julie You don't have your microphone, Julie. Okay. Can you hear me right now? Yes, perfect. Okay. I hope it will be okay because my computer is telling me that my internet connection is unstable. Uh, so let's see. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, RIL and the organizers and give a very, very warm hello, especially to all the friends and colleagues who are listening from La Reunion Island. I'm going to talk today about the management of the evacuations at La Fournaise, uh, taking the example of um, the April 2007 crisis, on which I made a feedback analysis when I was doing my PhD on La Reunion Island. And this feedback analysis is based on a set of um, social sciences methodologies, uh, including interviews, uh, risk perception surveys, and particip participative observations during the crisis, because uh, I was in Le Tremblay village when the crisis occurred. Um, I would like 
as a first slide. Uh, it doesn't, okay. Okay. So I would like to, to come back on this picture uh, of my computer screen yesterday. Uh, because I found it really amazing to see a, a duo presentation from Aline Pelletier and Stefan Dren. So it felt very positive to have on the same board and on the same page, uh, the Volcano Observatory Director and a civil, uh, protection, a civil protection officer in charge, uh, which is not necessarily uh, usual in France. Uh, and to discuss the emergency protocols uh, established to deal uh, with, vol with volcanic crisis, sorry. So they have highlighted that the protocols in place are very efficient and the, re the relationships uh, between the different actors are really strong and that they are allowing a successful monitoring uh, of the eruptions. Uh, I would say that it has not necessarily been the case in April 2007. And I'm wondering how this uh, 2007 eruption would be uh, managed today uh, with the, the current state of relationships between the observatory and civil protection. This was a magmatic eruption, uh, which started on April 2nd uh, within the caldera. So the, the caldera, which is also called the Anklo. And um, the eruption started very close to the caldera wall uh, above Le Tremblay village. And as you can see on the picture on the right side, uh, you have some buildings uh, and there's a plum. I don't know if you can see it, like small uh, white dots, which are the, the buildings which are the closest to the caldera wall in Le Tremblay. Uh, when the eruption had already uh, well developed. So um, this eruption lasted a month and it produced high volumes of uh, lava with lava flows uh, up to 60 kilometers per hour flowing uh, in the enclos. It produced also massive amount of gas uh, while the lava flows were entering the sea and a caldera collapse that occurred uh, in the cemetery area. And this eruption, just after a few days of eruption, was called eruption of the century, which is showing that it was a bit unusual. So if I'm wondering uh, why, how this eruption uh, would be managed uh, today, it's because in 2007, it was not really uh, properly managed. And uh, it's really clear when you look at the evacuation um, management um, organization. So in the first time, uh, Le Tremblay village was fully overcrowded with tourists. And while the Volcano Observatory had repeatedly uh, suggested to the authorities that an evacuation, at least of the tourists, uh, would be important, uh, the authorities uh, didn't, didn't restrict the access to the area for two days. In the second time, two days later, an unnecessary evacuation of the villagers was launched uh, in emergency. While uh, global, more globally speaking, during the eruption, you had um, peaks of pollution during this eruption, uh, which probably should have triggered uh, the necessity to evacuate. So I'm, I'm gonna develop these three different times uh, and these three different non-evacuations or evacuations at Le Tremblay. But first, I just want to come back on the protocols which are defined by the uh, OSEC emergency plan. So in 2007, the plan had been updated uh, two years ago in 2005. And here on the map, you can see the theoretical uh, restrictions of access that uh, occur uh, when a lava flow uh, is cutting the road um, and uh, going to the sea. So the red circles uh, highlights the places where uh, barriers for cars and pedestrians are set up near the eruption, while the light blue line uh, is the segment where the cars can park. They, they have to park just on one side. So Nicola uh, already described a little bit the problems of traffic, uh, jam, etc. <clears throat> and 
parking of the cars. So the cars theoretically have to park on one side and their nose has to be towards the south. So in case of an event, uh, they can just go directly. And so when they arrive in this area, they have directly theoretically to, to turn around. Um, the second uh, thing which is described uh, in this OSEC emergency plan is the theoretical evacuation decision uh, should an uh, eruption occur uh, and threaten uh, inhabited, un, sorry, <laughs> inhabited areas. So don't worry, I'm not gonna go in, into detail uh, in this figure, but just to summarize it. So on the right side in the box, you have um, the different types of actors involved in the crisis management system. So the volcanologists, the police officers, the media, the residents, etc. These different actors are in boxes uh, of different colors that represent the, the location on the island. So either in the headquarters in the capital city in Saint-Denis in the yellow box, or in the sub-regional or local uh, headquarters in the orange and um, um, brown box. Uh, and finally, you have the residents of Le Tremblay. So I did focus on, on the south um, of the island because it's where the eruption in 2007 happened. So the, the Tremblay inhabitants in the red box and the volcano observatory uh, in, in the blue box. And below these locations, you have all the interactions that are supposed to happen and to uh, sustain a decision of evacuation uh, should it be needed. And what is described is that the volcano observatory, so Aline and, and Stefan already underlined, underlined it yesterday. The volcano observatory has to observe um, signs of uh, seismicity uh, to uh, um, uh, advise the um, uh, regional headquarters to trigger an evacuation. And the regional headquarters uh, give the information to the local um, headquarters and to the population uh, and evacuate, decide to evacuate. It was really not the way things happened uh, in 2007. And the, lesson, the lessons we have learned from this eruption might help to better prepare for future evacuations uh, on, La Island, on La Reunion Island. So on April 2nd, um, an eruptive event opened uh, in the Enclos, as I told you. And as soon as the eruption began, you had a massive amount of people. It's what Nicola just described uh, in his talk. Uh, uh, people willing to see the lava flows, uh, cutting the road and entering the sea. And so you had many, many people coming on both sides of the lava flow uh, in Le Tremblay and uh, from the north, from Saint Rose. And uh, at that point, so the uh, rapidly the lava flow did cut the national road, which meant that at that point, people could only evacuate southward. All the people located in Le Tremblay could evacuate only southward, so just one direction of uh, evacuation. While the scientists, so based on um, the historical data and, and the knowledge of the volcano, the, the, the volcanologist immediately feared uh, that uh, a propagation of the volcanic activity or enclo. So you can see it on the dash uh, red line. And uh, it's exactly it, why they feared this uh, propagation of the magma is that um, you had preliminary phases uh, during this eruption in February and on the top on, in the summit uh, in the central crater of the volcano. Then on March, uh, end of March, uh, a small uh, lava flow on the flank. And on April 2nd, uh, a third phase. And this kind of three uh, steps, uh, magmatic uh, injection, because it was considered as 
uh, three patterns of uh, a same um, event. Uh, so these three steps made magmatic migration made the volcano observatory very nervous uh, about the possibility, well, maybe not nervous, very aware of the possibility of uh, a potential outside enclave propagation. So they suggested uh, immediately to the authorities to evacuate the tourists. Uh, um, and um, well, they, they, they made the authorities aware that uh, you had this possibility of uh, outside enclave propagation. And uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't tell it, but the, this three steps pattern is exactly what did happen uh, in um, 1977 and 19. <clears throat> 86. While, meanwhile, the, the, the scientists, so maybe something I, I should uh, precise is that um, the observatory um, was not 100% confident um, to be able to detect um, seismicity um, in case of the propagation of uh, the activity outside the enclos. And it took uh, some time to um, uh, settle um, an additional seismic station, uh, which is uh, a mobile one, uh, in the area to be absolutely sure uh, to be able to detect this seismic signal, which is uh, apparently, so the volcanologist on board will be able to tell you more about that if you want. Um, this this outside enclosed seismicity is a bit more uh, silent than um, the, um, the usual one. <clears throat> so um, the observatory had suggested that this uh, area uh, shouldn't be overcrowded like that with people. However, the authorities did not evacuate immediately. And <clears throat> Uh, you had 37 people on site on April 3rd, so on both sides of the lava flow, and up to 5,000 people at the same time uh, at Le Tremblay, which is uh, huge in case you would need uh, to evacuate. And it was empirically possible for anyone uh, knowing uh, the volcano, considering the velocity of the lava flows and knowing the <clears throat> the configuration of uh, this part of the island to know that it would have been impossible to evacuate uh, on time, everybody if needed. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the yellow lines are where the car, uh, the cars were parked. And you had cars parked in front of the gates of the Tremblay inhabitants, cars parked with the nose towards uh, the north instead of the south. Uh, on both sides of the road, it was uh, <clears throat> sort of a mess. <clears throat> and the yellow, uh, the, the white um, crosses are the, the point where the public had to stop, the, the pedestrians had to stop to observe the lava flow. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I, I told you that it was empirically possible <clears throat> to know that it wouldn't be possible to, to evacuate on time. And if you, if you are taking, like, uh, it's, it's a bit uh, crafty, but if you are taking the, the average eruptive rate observed during the eruption, you could say that uh, the lava flow, uh, a lava flow um, <clears throat> propagating outside Anklo would not take more than one hour to flow to the road from um, the, the, um, the star, which is located on the right side near, near the, the caldera wall. Uh, and it would have been instantly blocked uh, should um, the fissure have propagated uh, near the road. So, and uh, after the eruption, we have led um, pedestrian uh, evacuation simulations. Uh, the simulation was led only for 2,000 people. <clears throat> and only for 2,000 people, it was showing that to evacuate the 
little zone located in the blue rectangle, you would need an average uh, 16 minutes and up to 50 minutes to evacuate the slower people. Uh, so when you compare um, the time the lava flow might have taken uh, and a potential lava flow might have taken to reach the road and the time necessary to evacuate, it's not uh, anymore only empirically possible to say that it would have been it wouldn't have been possible, but the evacuation simulations made a posteriori also show this. <clears throat> um, so the, the, the observatory repeatedly continued to say that it was not a, a very uh, nice uh, context and it was at risk. And on April 4th, uh, the authorities finally closed the access to Le Tremblay to better face a potential evacuation procedure for the people living on site, which was uh, a main preoccupation. The idea was with all these tourists, even if it was possible to evacuate tourists on time, how would you evacuate the villages, um, <coughs> the village, should it be needed? <coughs> um, if we go back to this um, protocols defined uh, in the ORSEC emergency plan, <coughs> you have on the first line, the theoretical uh, evacuation decision. And <coughs> you have uh, on the second line, um, what happened. So it was a bit, um, it was a tricky situation because no seismic activity was observed outside the enclos by the observatory. Uh, but the observatory based on the geological historical knowledge was fearing that the magma might propagate. It, propagate. And they informed the regional headquarters about that. Uh, <clears throat> but it took two full days uh, before it was possible, uh, <clears throat> before the, the access to Le Tremblay was restricted. So during these two days, you had the perfect settings uh, for a disaster to occur. <clears throat> so now, <clears throat> sorry, let's move back <clears throat> to the way things um, happened two days later. Um, so the, the Tremblay was, um, the access to the Tremblay was restricted and you just add now in the village, uh, the inhabitants, um, some people from the media uh, and uh, some authorities uh, uh, going and coming to see what was happening. And on April 6, um, a red light, was observed from Le Tremblay <coughs> above, the caldera, above the caldera wall. <coughs> so <coughs> some inhabitants, some people on site were afraid it might be a lava flow propagating <coughs> outside the enclos uh, above the village because from, from the village, you could just see this light above. But other people on site were convinced that it was just the upper part of the very uh, high fountains <coughs> occurring in the enclos, so inside the caldera. And so that's, that's what I was describing. You had red lights uh, above the village. And some people uh, did consider uh, that uh, it was maybe uh, a propagation outside the enclos. Meanwhile, the Volcanological Observatory did not observe any sign uh, of activity outside the enclos while the, um, the, the additional station, seismic station had been settled by the observatory team. Um, and that's uh, how things uh, ended up uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, so you, had, you have the theoretical evacuation decision um, in, uh, in the first line, in the above line, and you have the things uh, which did really did happen on April 6th. 
and it's it just looks like a, a, a big mess. And it's not abnormal that um, the way things happen on the field are a bit different than the way things happen uh, in the um, emergency plans, plans which are just guidelines. But in that case, uh, uh, many problems were uh, very uh, um, clear, like let's say, yes, you, you, many problems were highlighted uh, by um, this decision, which was launched, so the evacuation decisions decision was launched in emergency by some policemen, which were located uh, on site without any approval from the regional headquarters. And while the observatory was saying there is no sign of uh, outside the UNCLO uh, propagation. So um, if we explore the reasons why uh, the things uh, happen like that, you have a, a combination, a set of uh, structural and conjunctural causes. And <clears throat> the, the, the first point is that um, for that kind of event, um, the authorities looked uh, unprepared. And the, it's, it's mainly because the institutional organization of the French overseas territories implies a massive turnover of the civil protection uh, stakeholders which are sent from uh, mainland uh, to, to the island. And um, they, they barely know uh, and um, the volcanic risk because it's, uh, and volcanic hazards, because it's not something you can uh, be trained uh, about in other territories. So, well, unfortunately it might be the case. Uh, now that we are more volcanoes, um, uh, looking more active in France, but um, the, the risk culture uh, from our authorities is quite low about volcanic hazards uh, in, in France. Uh, in addition to this, uh, and to be fair, uh, you, have, so you have some causes which are both structural and conjunctural, and in that case, the eruption was massive and very impressive. And when the evacuation was launched, the, the atmosphere in Le Tremblay was terrible. It was, uh, the ground was shaking permanently. It was very, very warm. You could, you could feel the heat of the lava flows. Uh, it was unbraceable with the gas. So it, it was a very uh, roaring atmosphere. It was, it was a, a stressful context, which um, which played uh, in the equation in the decision to to, to evacuate uh, quite violently, and I say quite violently because it's the way the inhabitants of Le Tremblay perceived the evacuation. Yeah. They were just taken out of their homes in emergency by policemen, completely afraid of what was going on and shouting at them, "Leave, leave." So it was a, a kind of a special atmosphere. And it was mainly due because of this in, uh, misinterpretation of the hazard. So I did say that it's both structural and conjunctural because uh, even outside of the Anclo eruptions are structurally possible uh, on La Fournaise. So it's, you have uh, every few decades, um, outside of the Anclo eruption. So it's part of the, of the hazard. And it was also conjunctural because it was uh, so multi-hazards in this case with fires uh, in Le Tremblay, et cetera. It was um, difficult to deal with. And um, another problem, uh, which, was, which is both structural and conjunctural in that case, is that the helicopter was not um, available immediately uh, to make an aerial, aerial recognition. Um, and uh, and when it, uh, the helicopter was able to land off from Saint-Denis, it didn't have uh, enough oil to go 
to the observatory in Plaine des Caves to pick up someone from the volcano observatory. It came directly to Le Tremblay, where uh, nobody from the observatory was available. Uh, so, um, yeah, a, a bit uh, a bit of a mess uh, from many points of view. Um, I did put this picture of um, um, a rabbit, uh, which is complying to the um, sanitary rules, uh, just to show that um, the the influence of the, the the cultural beliefs and past events. The event did happen uh, during the Easter weekend and mostly at the hour of the Holy Mass. And it's exactly when the 1986 eruption also did occur. And you have this sort of, uh, which is called in psychology, normalization bias, which did uh, occur uh, in the mind of, um, of the people. So they were thinking like, it, it did happen like that in the past. It's uh, just beginning to happen exactly again the same way. And we will have uh, the lava propagating outside of uh, the enclos. And um, structurally speaking, uh, the um, a main uh, cause uh, of the way the information, so you had many, uh, rumors, false information. The observatory had to call uh, to the, the to deny information uh, several times, and it's mainly because um, you have uh, radio freedom and uranium, and that uh, fifty-two percent of the um, radio time uh, on the day of the evacuation was dedicated to direct intervention, intervention from the public. And you had many people calling, giving contradictory information and verified the observatory had to correct what was said. Uh, and so the um, Radio Freedom is a most listened radio uh, on La Réunion. And uh, it was uh, the, the, the way it's displayed with the live uh, system with many people able to communicate um, uh, raw information without verification was uh, a main problem during that eruption in terms of information management. Uh, last but not least, but I won't develop a lot this, um, probably uh, an evacuation would have been necessary uh, in the face of the massive amount of gas which uh, was invading uh, Le Tremblay village. Uh, but there was a global absence of uh, adapted protocols in the plants. And it's mainly because in the French law uh, in 2007, when you had uh, an atmospheric pollution, uh, the, the law said that the authorities sh should make uh, uh, stop the source of pollution, which is very adapted to a volcano, as you can guess. And the second reason uh, why you had an absence of adapted protocols is uh, that the, um, the, the information and alert uh, thresholds for uh, SO2, for example, defined by the, by the French law, uh, we consider that you have to alert, <clears throat> to inform and alert the population when the, um, the threshold is uh, overpassed during three consecutive hours. And it's adapted to uh, a volcanic event with uh, you had massive peaks during shorter times but it was not taking into account so it was undefined but it was absolutely unbraceable at the tremblay at some point and it should probably have been evacuated uh, considering um, else um, issues so um, some takeaways for better um, management of future eruptions and, and lessons from these eruptions. It, it highlighted uh, the need for scenarios, taking into account the specificities of the territory and different temporal contexts. 
So we should think about evacuation, nightly evacuations. We should think that you have evacuation refusals. I didn't say it, but it was a case in 2007. Evacuation re refusals uh, are inhabitants going back home. Um, and we, we should take into account the risk perceptions, including the normalization bias, uh, which is linked to the past eruptions. There is also a, a very important necessity to think bigger. And this eruption was called the eruption uh, of the century, while it, it, in the end, it was massive and impressive, but it stayed inside the caldera. And we have to think about high intensity hazards higher than this and unrest or eruptions in more densely populated areas. Um, there is also the necessity of exercises to train the new civil protection officers on volcanic hazards and to train civil protection officers who just arrived and the uh, observatory staff to work together. And I think there is um, a value uh, in, in the idea of integrating in the main uh, management system some networks of trained observers, uh, because you have many people on Arena who are in love with a volcano for decades, with a very deep understanding of the volcano and its hazards and eruptive history and, and of the territory. And they end up truly would be able to recognize the different volcanic hazards and to communicate with the authorities with a shared vocabulary uh, in case of an event and um, like a larger um, um, intensity event or something like that. And I, I, I was referring to finish, uh, referring to the Vichyas uh, network, Vichyas network in Ecuador, which is very uh, efficient from that perspective. Um, that's it, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Julie, lots of lots of um, interesting and, and relevant points there. Um, I, I saw that during the um, presentation, Joseph um, sent in a question. Um, do you have access to that, Oriel? Yes, uh, Julie, maybe you do. You? So, well, Joseph, if you want also to ask the question directly, but the question was, what was the alert code? Um, during the evacuation of the population at that time? Uh, so it was, um, it, it was uh, what was described by uh, Stefan Dren yesterday. It was, uh, so what would it be in, in English? It's red, it's 2-2. Two, two yes, it's eruption. Yes. So eruption. So it's the same alert code that if the lava would have been far from any population, there were no above alert code or that's it. Different. Mm. No, the, the, the evacuation was uh, decided out of any um, framework in terms of alert level or um, in terms of protocols. Then there is uh, the other part of the question from Joseph Makundi, who was, what are the lessons learned from the eruption, the 2007 eruption. I think it would be great what? to have um, your point of view, Aline's point of view, and Stefan's point of view from, you know, every person. Um, well, I, I think I've uh, developed it uh, a bit on, on my last slide. Um, so I think the main lesson is that um, we have potential wonderful networks able to deal really well with volcanic crisis and Iranian. But we also have uh, a too technocratic and reactive management system and that we can make progress in taking into account um, social aspects uh, such as uh, risk perception and, and, um, and territorial and socio-economical aspects to define uh, scenarios, uh, taking into account hazards of higher intensity. I think it's, it would be a, a synthesis of uh, what I'm thinking uh, about. And um, maybe, maybe I could mention, um, I didn't mention it in the presentation, but uh, Andy and Nicola uh, made uh, um, 
a media content analysis on this eruption. And uh, it's, it's providing uh, many common points, uh, but the, the media analysis in itself, and we had a communication on the social networks yesterday, the media analysis in itself is, and the relationships uh, to the media and the way um, the mediatic information is provided to the population is also an, a topic in itself and uh, important to consider. See, there's Olivier uh, with, with a question for you, Julie. Olivier? Yep. Yeah. Um, I just want to add something to what Nicola and Julie said, and perhaps uh, uh, this will give you a uh, more concrete answer to, to your question uh, at the end of my presentation. Uh, some huge legal uncertainties can derive from an, emerger uh, an emergency plan. And I, I would like to present an example from the current uh, emergency plan of La Réunion. Uh, this plan is, uh, provides a ban, uh, provide, sorry, uh, this plan provide, provides a ban on access to what is called the partiot de l'enclos, that is to say in English, the high part of the uh, enclos. Uh, and uh, uh, this pro, uh, it's providing a, a ban on this access as soon as alert number one is triggered by the state deputy. So every time uh, an alert number one is triggered by the state deputy, uh, the state deputy uh, issues a formal regulation providing such a ban. But from a legal point of view, what can what is uh, we are, we have to, to determine uh, what is the partiot de l'enclos what is the high part what can be what can what what can we uh, understand under this legal notion of uh, partiot de l'enclos of high part on the uh, enclos uh, last last year during the april eruption uh, somebody was fined uh, because it he was uh, at the bottom of the grand pont of the Grand Pont, uh, somewhere located at an altitude of uh, 300, 380 meters. Uh, the, no, the, this uh, this uh, the person was near the front of uh, a lava flow. And the police officer uh, thought that the place was part of the high part of the enclos. Uh, Whereas this is approximately a part of the enclos that is situated above the altitude of uh, 1,800 meters, approximately. Uh, or uh, the most important principle of criminal law uh, is the legality of criminal offenses and penalties. Uh, it means that nobody can be sentenced if there isn't any clear definition of what is forbidden. And in this case, uh, the current emergency plan can lead equally, equally to an illegal breach of freedom of movement and or uh, to a risk for the safety of people who get near to a lava flow. And there is more. Uh, last September, there was a magmatic intrusion under the eastern flank of Piton de la Fournaise. And uh, the, volcano, the Volcanological Observatory uh, clearly, uh, clearly warns that uh, the civil protection services that a low altitude eruption was po probable. There, is, there was a probability of a low altitude eruption. But immediately, the state deputy uh, triggers the alert number one and issues the usual regulation uh, providing that a ban on the access to the, party, the, the, the high part of the enclos. Uh, I warned the head of the state deputy cabinet that this measure that this measure was completely inadequate in view of the location of the of the main risks. Why a ban on the, to, on the access to the high part of the enclos? Uh, whereas the main volcanic the main uh, volcanic hazards was, were located at, the, at a low altitude. Uh, nothing has been done after my, my, this warning, but uh, the uh, civil protection services said to me that uh, the, this legal problem uh, will be eliminated in the, uh, in the next emergency plan. 
or if somebody was killed or injured in this area this day, uh, this, would, uh, uh, this would have certainly led to criminal prosecution and sentences for uh, the, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe the head of the uh, state deputy cabinet or some people of the uh, civil protection services. So uh, that's why that's what I, I want to say uh, to say uh, at the end of my presentation. Uh, when you when you make an emergency plan, you have to uh, uh, you have to ensure that the design of the uh, when you design and an, an when an emergency plan, you have you have to be sure that eh bien, uh, that uh, what you do is complying what, uh, with the applicable law. Because if uh, this, is, this is not the case, you can both illegally infringing some fundamental rights or creating risks, creating risks for people who are on the, on, on the field. Thank you. Th thank you, Olivier. For that, that clarification that I don't know if it clarifies or, or, or complicates it's a very complicated situation legally and um, in terms of the monitoring response which is what I, I wondered if we could open up the 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 question you know what lessons and what development uh, has resulted from that 2007 experience from the perspective of the observatory operations where we've got the current director and two ex-directors here in the audience. So Aline, Patrick and Nicola, uh, I wonder if you could comment on um, how things have developed in terms of response and, and operations uh, since that time and how such an event, if it happens today, might, might, be, might be handled. Aline is probably dealing with the current volcanic crisis. <laughs> okay, so Patrick, okay, okay. Uh, Nicola? Yeah. yeah um, yes, uh, I know that uh, Aline sent me a text and she is dealing with uh, the TV set. Maybe we can, uh, we can see because uh, um, Patrick was uh, previously uh, a director of the observatory. So he can give is uh, his comment then I and then Aline like that we've got a historical approach maybe <laughs> yes ah my microphone uh, I'm sorry um, Andy I, I miss your question <laughs> can, can you repeat please <laughs> it, it was how um in the aftermath of 2007, the April 2007 eruption and the response, um, how, how the observatory evolved um, to, to it, it, in the light of the experiences um, from response to that uh, eruption, and how, if an event like that happens today, how it may be handled differently, or how, how it might be handled. Hmm. By, from the observatory perspective. Yeah. Um, uh, but may, maybe I'm not the right person to give an answer to your question. Um, because when I, was, when I was in charge of the observatory, uh, of course, the situation was very different. The observatory worked very differently because it was uh, uh, 30 years ago now. And um, uh, during that time, uh, I have no eruption <laughs> to deal with. And uh, so uh, the, the link with the civil protection was very few. Uh, we, we, we don't have uh, to, to work with uh, civil protection because there is nothing happened during. Uh, uh, yeah, do you know, uh, you know that? Um, on La Fournaise, there is a, a gap uh, for the, in the eruption list between uh, uh, 1992 and uh, 1998. For six years, there is no eruption. The volcanoes stay quiet. And um, 
my my directory was during this period. <laughs> so I have nothing to do, in fact. <laughs> It was it was the best director we we never <laughs> had. <laughs> okay, so I can take the floor uh, before Aline come back. But I think um, a big part of the answer have been uh, have been uh, 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 give by uh, uh, Patrick. We've got a, a very young observatory, and uh, the experience uh, changed a lot with the time. Um, last week, Olivier um, planned a workshop and uh, he, he gave me a, a talk. I was speaking about uh, uh, the incertitude of uh, eruption coming. And I, I tried to list statistically what uh, can happen, uh, depending of eruption, depending of uh, uh, position of the vent, depending of the time of uh, the seismic crisis. And uh, yesterday, um, Patrick asked me, uh, could you make it for 1998 eruption? Because uh, it corresponds to the, 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 the need we have on Earth. And uh, I just realized that in 1998, when the eruption occurred with a part outside of the enclos, Thomas Tadache was the director at this time, and he, he get only 18 years of statistic of the observatory. So um, in 2007, you can add the uh, nine years, make uh, 27 years of statistics. So of course, now we, we, we get, we have more and more uh, things to feed the model. And we can now maybe look behind us and see uh, what is the corresponding example uh, for this eruption. You know, for the current eruption, uh, we get a, a fissure. The main fissure is uh, the lonely fissure, uh, in a way, uh, is exactly on the same place than the 2007 one, the March 2007 one, and the March 1986 one. That means, this is exactly the same place where we had an eruption very big on April. You know, the first eruption was there and a few days after the second eruption, the second fissure was uh, at 700 meter high, just uh, near the road, the, the one uh, Julie uh, speak about. And um, in 1986, it was at the same place for the first fissure or the first or second. So after, in, in 1996, uh, 1986 and in 2007, the second feature, the, the most important part of the eruption, opened eight, after eight hours. So we, we looked the statistic, and when those eight hours were spent for, for this current eruption, we are very quiet. We said, okay, it's maybe not the same. Of course, we can look for other eruption as 1977. Uh, it was completely different, but use the historical phase and use the historical trend can help very much to, uh, is, is very powerful to have an approach and quite attitude and to get best expertise. I don't know if I, I, I answer your question, but I saw Aline is there now. She can add some information. Maybe you can rephrase your question. Yes. I don't know what is the question, but uh, I can add a few words concerning the 2007 eruptions. So at that time, uh, I was uh, just a young PhD student, but I was already involved in the crisis management uh, at the observatory, thanks to my PhD supervisor. Uh, so for me, the, the interaction between the observatory and the civil protections was already strong at that time. But the uh, example of this option uh, shows, shows that um, independent phenomena as uh, bad weather, fake news on radio can disrupt uh, the theoretical uh, chains of the emergency plane. When it was very urgent, it's very complicated for all the actors to follow uh, this plan. Uh, for me, 
so with the view, uh, I was at that time just a PhD student, not the director, is that there is too many things at the same time, fake news, bad weather, the problem with the air, so many things uh, that disrupt uh, this, uh, this uh, emergency plan. Uh, just a, a few words, but uh, Stefan can add this. Uh, since then, since 2007, the emergency plan, so the ORSEC plan, has been revoked two times. Uh, it's currently uh, revoked, so to better take into account uh, all uh, the hazard for population evacuations. So I don't know if, uh, Stefan, you can add some words uh, concerning this new, new plan. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to, to say different things about the different uh, intervention of the different people. So first, uh, to uh, complete uh, what, uh, um, what you said, uh, yes, now we have uh, a new plan. Uh, we are writing, updating the new plan. So I think this is a... Um, um, a chance for everybody that uh, the plan, the emergency plan, is not totally blocked. We can uh, update uh, this plan uh, when we can, uh, when we have the feeling that it is not perfect. So uh, we can change some things, and uh, that's why we, uh, as Olivier Dupere said, uh, for instance, uh, the, the map who describes the different parts of the enclos uh, is taken into account in the new plan. And now the definition of the different uh, part of the enclos is, uh, uh, will be in the, the future plan. So it's very important to um, deal with the different issues that we can meet during uh, the different eruption and to share uh, the different experiences in order to improve the emergency plan. So this workshop uh, for that is very important. Um, I would like to add something about uh, what Julie said. Um, the um, civil protection officers uh, here in uh, La Prefecture change every three years. So uh, for instance, for my, uh, for, my, for my experience, the first meeting that I have when I come here in La Réunion was a meeting with the observatory organized by my, uh, uh, the last officer before me. So um, you're right, uh, the volcano risk is not uh, uh, in the culture of the civil protection officers, for sure, when we uh, come from, from uh, the metropole. So, um, now it's a one of the um, uh, lesson learned uh, for us to have this uh, meeting with the observatory um, in order to understand what is uh, an eruption uh, because there's different uh, phase uh, during an eruption. Uh, what uh, the observatory can give us some um, information and then uh, all the, um, the different actions that we have to take uh, after the eruption. So it's very important for us to understand that. Um, maybe one thing that we have to improve is the field exercise. Um, for the moment, we don't have um, the staff and uh, the money uh, to, uh, to uh, deal with a big exercise on the field. And for me, this is a big lack uh, in the civil protection reaction that we have for the moment. But I think if we want to, to make a, a bigger size on the field, we need everybody uh, uh, of the different uh, parts and the different services uh, of La Réunion to organize that, the observatory, but others, uh, because it's a huge job to make a field exercise like you described if we want to uh, make a remake of the two, uh, 2007 uh, eruption. But this is a very, very important point. But for the moment, there's no uh, means to do that.
Did you have a question, Oriel? I saw you put your hand up briefly. I was clapping, saying that yes, an exercise is something that is really, really missing. And I was, I wanted to ask the question if, if one day an exercise happened, did, did was, um, was an exercise um, uh, organized on La Réunion ever? Of uh, population evacuation or never, this never happened? Do you know, Julie, or, I don't know, never. Okay, I think it's great tomorrow, uh, on Wednesday, uh, we'll have a, a presentation from the civil protection at, at Goma. Jonathan Macoun is connected, and we will learn about uh, big scale <laughs> evacuation exercise on a big city. So we can link with, with this, and maybe this will give you some ideas, Stefan, to how, <laughs> how to organize. We have also Stefano Chori here. Maybe you want to add a word about this evacuation exercise. Um, Italy or something? Because we, with Stefano, we, we were going to try and put together a desktop exercise um, to, to have a, a civil, civil protection and scientific and monitoring actors playing together. Uh, sadly, we weren't able to, to really follow through on that because of the situation, but maybe it's something we, we should continue to think about and try and find um, funds and the way um, to, to do that um, over, over, over the coming, coming months. And to, to continue with that idea, Stefano, of, of building a proper exercise that, that will be a, 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 of use in better preparation for, for such, such events. Yeah, obviously, uh, as you said, um, Preparing a, a big exercise involving also the population of Kaira, uh, big efforts and uh, a huge amount of, of money <laughs> sometimes. Um, we, we had actually uh, a real exercise in 2019 on the Camp of the and uh, it was uh, a mixed exercise of so tabletop, but also involved with part of the population. And, um, we work for each municipality of the country of Ray, looking at uh, others. For uh, each municipality, a sample of something like 100 people uh, just to simulate the evacuation with buses and, uh, and so on. And uh, we have different uh, results uh, according to the level of uh, perception and information on each municipality. And, uh, well, I don't know. In, from my point of view, uh, the problem with big exercise is that uh, later on it's difficult, it's difficult to, uh, to retrieve uh, lesson learned. Because when you organize something from A to Z, it's uh, really difficult to, uh, to get the final result of any single uh, aspect you have investigated. Uh, what I found that is uh, important also to have uh, um, partial exercises on different aspects. So scientific aspects or maybe evacuation of uh, only one common municipality or uh, um, I don't know, the, the interaction between scientists and the civil protection, the interaction between different level of uh, civil protection or administrative uh, uh, authorities, you know. And uh, so also testing uh, uh, separately different aspects that are hazardous is a piece of Obviously, sometimes it, it, it can be also useful to test all the chain of uh, command and control and the, 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 how population can react. And, and it is uh, also very, very important that the communication and this change of communication with people that's uh, that's crucial also. And anyway, I uh, I want to underline to stress that uh, what uh, also Julie told her, um, in his presentation at the beginning of the presentation. I appreciated very much the interaction you have in Larinon uh, between the observatory and uh, uh, the protection. Uh, I visited the Réunion uh, many, many years ago. It was in 1999, maybe. And probably, um, well, at least 
for what I remember, this uh, interaction was not so, so strong, absolutely. So uh, I'm really happy to see this uh, cooperation. Nicola. Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. Uh, I, I would like to add just uh, something. Um, I'm I'm okay with uh, OEL about uh, some exercise. I know I'm aware, uh, as Stefan said, it's very very expensive in time, maybe in money. But um, I'm not sure. I'm true of that. But I think, and maybe Patrick and uh, Julie will uh, tell. I, I'm wrong, but I think there was only five. Um, five evacuation done in Wainan Island on the volcano. Two on uh, uh, 1977 eruption because the, the eruption get two uh, lava flow on two different places outside of the enclosure, very very close, but it uh, it generates two different um, uh, evacuation. One in 1990. Uh, 1986, one in 2002, and one in 2007. It was real uh, action, real evacuation. And uh, for my friend in Italy, I will, uh, I will use a, a word, you know, well, it was really casino there. And uh, it was very, 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 very difficult to manage everything. So uh, I think uh, an evacuation exercise could be very interesting to prepare the population. Thank you, Nicola. I will um, take the lead because uh, Andre, uh, Andy has some problem with connection. Uh, Diego first and then uh, Julie. Diego, if you want to say something. Yes, yeah, uh, I have two, two comments. Uh, one is uh, is to link uh, a little bit uh, with the session of yesterday and the, the case of uh, the 2007 eruption. And uh, uh, if I understood well from the, the presentation of Julie, uh, there is some estimation, uh, estimate of the velocity of the lava flow of 2007, which is about the maximum is two meters uh, second. So I wonder if uh, the, the protocol of the effusive crisis and the lava flow model, how they work in the case of a low altitude uh, uh, eruption like that one, because uh, uh, in, uh, in one hour, the lava flow will uh, travel seven kilometers at that velocity. So we have no time to run the models. And, and, and so I wonder, in, in the case of uh, an hazard assessment or, or the decision of uh, evacuation, uh, I think there is no time if there is a low altitude event to run models and to see at what time the lava flow will reach the road. So uh, I, in that case of uh, big eruptions, uh, what we can do to improve uh, uh, the, the, the capacity to decide for an evacuation or not. Uh, and this is a question for, the, for Aline, for the observatory and for the civil protection in general. And then I have another question more general, uh, which is about the volcanic risk. And in any course of uh, risk and volcanic risk, we learn uh, which the risk uh, is, the result, is a number which results uh, from a formula. And so I would like to know from the observatories and for, for, from the civil protection, if they have numbers during uh, each day or uh, if they evaluate with the numbers, uh, the risk, volcanic risk, and how they deal with this number to decide uh, to, to increase an alert, uh, uh, level or not, or if they do without calculation of this number, because I, I want to know if this formula is really applied in real cases, or if it's something more theoretical, which is in, in, in real cases is, is not really considered. Uh, okay, thank you.
Julie, do you want to answer to comment on that? Or Stéphane? Because the, or Nicolas or Aline, but I'm not sure they are. Aline is dealing with the current crisis right now. So. For, for the first question, maybe I, I, I would like to know if, uh, uh, um, if there is no time to run a model, uh, how is based the decision of an evacuation? For example, in a case like uh, the 2007 eruption, how, how uh, it would be taken now? So for, for the first, uh, then Stefan, I'll let you, uh, for the modeling parts, I can say that with the down flow go model I have now, I will not be able to say when the lava will reach the road, but I will be able very quickly to, the, to say where, if we know that it's, it's, it's opening. So if there is, if we locate the fissure opening in five minutes, we know that it will go down slope and, exactly. and what's the area. And this will be communicated to, to civil protection in really no time, in 10 minutes they know. But then this doesn't mean if, if the lava will reach the road in 15 minutes or more, and if there is time to evacuate this, I don't know, maybe Stefan, what would you do? I don't know. So in this case, there is no need, for example, to wait the effusion rate. No, in any case, we don't there wait. There is no time think... and there is no, no need. So the only need is to know maybe where it will be because it will be very fast there. Yeah, and the where we can we can know it fast if we know where the fissure open. Then we can also make probability maps and, and scenarios. But Stefan, I'll let you comment. Yeah, thank you. So first, I'm not a magician. So if it's uh, too loud, I can't do uh, anything. But uh, to, to give you uh, uh, examples, uh, for the last eruption, uh, for instance, uh, Aline said me that it was in the south of uh, Dolomieu. So, and uh, we have uh, nearly the good location, in fact, uh, without uh, detecting the, the, the fissures. So we can have a first um, location of the eruption. Um, so if we take the case or uh, if an insane me, uh, the, the, the eruption could be in the very low levels of uh, Enclos near the road. Of course, it's not a good uh, news for me, but um, I can send uh, very quickly uh, the police because I'm in contact directly with the police, the, the operational staff of the police. I, I can, I have a, um, also the, the direct contact with the firemen, and so they can do something on the road. And I have a direct contact with the uh, uh, road services uh, in La Réunion. So uh, very quickly, around 10 minutes for the police and for the firemen, I can have a first uh, civil protection response to uh, close the, the, the road. This is the first, um, and then we can uh, increase the civil protection response in function of the observers on the ground. Uh, if they give me some details about uh, the, the distance between the eruption and the, and the road, we can have an, a notion. It's not the, the reality, but uh, just a notion. And then, um, Thanks to um, the police helicopter, we can have around 20 minutes, 30 minutes, the first pictures of the eruption too, if the helicopter is available. So um, it's not perfect uh, for sure. Uh, there is some bad uh, scenarios uh, for sure. Uh, for the moment, we can have a response, a very good an efficient civil protection response for every case. So it's not possible. But uh, we have some means to, to do something very quickly. OK, thank you. Uh, I can just add some words. Yes, uh, I just listened to the, the last part of the, uh, Stefan's comments, but just to to give you an information, when we have low elevation uh, fissure, as in 2007, uh, 
the seismic crisis is very long. So during that time, we know approximately where is the magma. So during that time, we exchange uh, every, every hour, every tenth of minute with the civil protection to give the information to civil protection, to alert them that be careful, the magma is very low in elevation, etc. And as for example, uh, in uh, the last September, we have a, a big magma intrusion to the eastern flank volcano. The seismic crisis lasts about uh, two days. And during these two days, we were in a connection with sea protection to give the information where was the magma, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Nico, Nicola. Yes, um, you have to remember something else. It's, uh, um, Julie told us uh, about very, very speed uh, advance of uh, the lava flow, but it was not the front lava flow. Um, it was during a phase very specific when the collapse occurred and uh, everything was done before the world was, was ever cut on the middle and it was not a problem. The first phase which cut the road was before. If you look on the history of the volcano, this kind of eruption occurred uh, two or three times. Uh, I guess uh, in, in 2007, in uh, 1943, at the equivalent uh, elevation, and in uh, 2006, uh, I think, because of uh, a, a new part of eruption occurred in the, in the age of the north part of the rampart. Uh, the, the lonely thing I can add for that, it's in 1996, 1986, uh, Fissure opened on the road, on Saint-Philippe. But uh, it was very, very uh, long um, process. We first, the opening of the road, people came there, make some um, movie. They also tried to... to, to to pass across the fissure with car, put in some piece of wood and piece of metal. And after that, the, the lava arrived after the fissure and after the road, not on the road. But uh, okay, it's not very sharp. Okay, it's not very quick. It takes time and maybe you can take time to evacuate and uh, keep calm uh, for, for, for what we, we saw before. Yeah, um, if I can give some information about the, uh, the 1986 story. I was there, I remember very well. <laughs> and to, to confirm the, the word of uh, Nicola, I can just say that we have time uh, to discuss on the open fissure, just near the open fissure, with the, the TV. Uh, and uh, to uh, to be uh, in in uh, in the news <laughs> at that moment, and it effectively it take a very long time uh, to see the lava opening. Uh, we are waiting during uh, hours uh, just near the fissure, uh, we're thinking if uh, yes or no we will have an eruption uh, in this place or not, and in fact. But when the lava came out of the fissure, uh, the lava was completely degas. There is no explosion. There is no uh, pyroclastic material. It's, it was only um, a flowing of a completely degas lava at that time, because it was a long way to come to this point. The, the, the only risk, maybe, if I can continue just a little bit, um, the fissure opened at, uh, if I remember well, the altitude of 30 meters. So it was very close from the ocean. And uh, our main, main concern was to uh, see if, uh, yes or no, the fissure will open on land or into the sea, because it can ch completely change the dynamism of the eruption. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Stefano, you want to go ahead. Sorry. 
Well, I was wondering if you have also some uh, problem with plant stability on that slope, even in the submarine part of the volcano or, or not. Is the plant of the volcano stable? So, Stefano, we do, your micro is not working very well, but uh, we, we, I heard um, he was asking about flank instability. Maybe Aline, you want to say something? Do we have ideas about uh, this risk as well? Uh, we have uh, flank instability, yes, uh, both uh, on the quarter or on the eastern flank. Uh, we have a, a sliding eastern flank. Uh, the eastern flank of the volcano uh, from uh, Les Grandes Pentes to the eastern coast is uh, sliding continuously uh, uh, by gravity. And uh, during the eruption, we have big motion of this flank as observed in 2007. So maybe one time we have disruption of this flank. So we, we're looking at that. And a, every day, and uh, we have also a landslide inside the crater, in the, in the Dolomio crater. So we have a risk of uh, rockfall in the crater, but it's very usual at the volcano. Sorry. So it's media because we have a big plume at that moment on the volcano. Uh, tac, tac, tac. Um, yes, so uh, what was the question? Uh, yes, sliding, is that? Yeah, I think you, you answer. It was okay. about this, if the, flank, if the flank instability will happen, if you will see it and communicate it. Well, see, but we don't know, because if you have a, a big sliding, a big landslide of the eastern flank, we didn't have it uh, since the observatory uh, is, uh, is here, because the last time it was uh, 4,000 years ago. But uh, we look at that. We have a GPS receiver on this flank to follow this, um, these motions. And during uh, big eruptions and uh, far eruptions, so eruptions which occur far from the summit, it was during that time we have a big sliding. So we think that the, the motion of the magma to the lowest level is guided by this sliding. So we can follow this uh, in real time. But uh, we did not know yet uh, what will be the precursor if you have a big uh, failure of this flank because uh, we didn't have it for the moment. And if I can add also uh, a word concerning what uh, Patrick uh, says. So in 1986, we have a, a propagation uh, far from the summit. So at that time, the network was not uh, the same as uh, now. Now we have uh, more than 100 uh, uh, stations on the volcano. But we did not know if uh, a such um, propagation occur now, we can see this propagation because uh, this kind of propagation is magma, uh, degassing magma, in fact. So we don't know if we have uh, an eruptive fissure very far without gas, we can see eruptive tremor. So we have in mind that the observatory can not see everything. Uh, for instance, uh, during eruption, sometimes we have a new eruptive fissure which open very close to uh, an eruption, which is ongoing. And we cannot see if a new fissure open is too close of the first one. That occurs in 2019 when 10 days after the beginning of the eruption, new fissures uh, open uh, 100 meters uh, away from the main vent. And we didn't see on the, um, on the seismometer because it was too close of the main eruptive sites. So uh, the civil population is aware of that, that some activity can uh, very uh, occur uh, um, without precursors and without uh, signals. Thank you, Aline. Um, maybe can, I can I just take the, the word to answer to Diego um, second part of question, which was about numbers. I will just show quickly um, my screen. Uh, can you see this, the map? This is the priority of lava flow uh, invasion. So Diego, we, we, we calculated that. Um, this was the, the first part, uh, first uh, lava flow probability invasion probability was done in 2012 by the ALEA project led by the director of the observatory at that time, Andrea Di Muro. And we have updated this um, recently. This is a paper under review where here we have numbers of the um, 
what are the probability of lava flow invasion around the volcano. And also, this is something we have not updated, but here I hope you can see these are numbers. The cast uh, the map of the risks. This was done uh, as well in 2012 in the Alia project based on the probability of lava flow in invasion and uh, the buildings. So there are numbers a bit about what the risk, what are the risks of each buildings. Once again, this has not been updated and we hope to update it uh, soon, I think. That's it. Thank you, Oriel. So, thanks very much, Oriel, for showing that. Um, there's there's a, a final question, I think, for or comment from Nicola. And at that point, we'll be more or less at our lunch break. Nicola. Yes, but we have time because it's two o'clock in the afternoon for us. Lunch break is <laughs> far from. Yeah. Okay, just a, a comment about uh, what Aline says. Uh, she said uh, that uh, the observatory is a little bit blind during uh, an eruption with uh, transit of magma outside of the enclos if uh, the magma is completely degassing. De it's, it's true, Aline, but uh, remember the 1998 event when uh, the eruption uh, moved outside of the enclos? Uh, a posteriori, uh, even if it was completely degassing eruption, Jean Battaglia uh, get a very good result um, about the transit following the tremor map. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong with that. Aline, you have to say if, if he's wrong or not. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, at that time, the Oranclo was very close to the Enclo. It's not, uh, okay. it's not as a, a very uh, far uh, Oranclo eruptions. Okay, but uh, I think uh, the, the expertise of uh, the observatory now with uh, the quality of, uh, sure. of the, the um, uh, of the network and the quality of uh, uh, seismologists um, let us uh, think that uh, if something happens outside of the enclos, you, you will maybe um, uh, lost him, but by chance, I think you are going to see it. Yes, and compared to uh, 1986, at that time, I don't remember, Patrick, we, were, we, have, we had. Uh, maybe uh, 10 or 20 stations. And now we have 100 stations. So even we have some station out of service, we can follow better the, the population. I don't remember exactly the number of stations, but <laughs> it was completely different than now. And um, at the beginning of the, it was still the beginning of the observatory. I remember that the, the observatory is there since 1980. So it was just uh, six years later. And um, uh, this eruption was very new for us because uh, the, the other one in uh, 1981, 83, 84 was uh, near the summit as usual. And uh, I remember we were surprised of course by the first one in February, 1981. And this one was completely different. And so uh, I, but I, I don't remember exactly what, what uh, other station we are. We are. Okay, if, there, if there are no further comments, um, I might say, oh, there is a further comment. Let's let this run. <laughs> Julie. Uh, no, it, it was not a comment from me, it was just to uh, highlight a comment which has been made by Anna Dietrich uh, in the chat uh, when we were talking about the exercises. And she was saying that around Mont Rainier in Orting, Washington, they do a citywide Lahore evacuation drill. Um, uh, um, and she believes that it's every year. So the fundings are probably much better there, but it's, um, it's just giving an idea that with fundings, it's possible uh, on a regular basis to organize um, 
um, um, real size exercises. So I don't know um, how we could push to have uh, these kinds of fundings uh, to, to provide the possibility to do that on Laranian, but it, it would be something to think about. I think now that there is the will from the civil protection and from and all the actors around it, it's going to happen <laughs> to make this exercise. I hope. Okay, Andy, do we? Is there any more comments um, for this morning? I, th I think we we better. Um take take the opportunity to break so that we can set the exercise up um, um so we'll reconvene at two o'clock uh, we've been discussing uh, in the background how we'll run the exercise we've decided we will run it only on zoom so if there's any of you out there who don't have the zoom um link because you're watching it from the youtube site but you, you you're taking part in the exercise send us an email or, or Oriel and myself and we'll send you the zoom link so that you can join in um, from two o'clock this afternoon that will begin with a 30 minute presentation from Patrick on uh, the unrest scenarios uh, we've identified for um, Pete on la Fournesse for the Eve project and then we'll spend two and a half hours um, going through the exercise to close out at five o'clock Central European time this afternoon. So bon appétit, enjoy your lunch, and um, see you in, in a couple hours. of hours. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you to the speakers. <laughs>